Well, I actually owned a tank at that time. A, a, a military <laughs> tank. You owned a tank? Yes. Oh, God. Do you want the story? <laughs> yes, yeah. we do. Okay. <laughs> Not just me. We, we need to know this. I've always been into this. motorbikes all my life, so I've always okay. had loads of motorbikes. So. Kevin, sorry. You owned a tank, you've always been into motorbikes. There's a long <laughs> way to go there. Kevin. I know. Rampada! Rampada! Sejam bem-vindos a mais um episódio. Whoop! Yeah, we changed language again. This is the fourth uh, English speaking episode. And, uh, but first, uh, I'm gonna have uh, say a huge thanks to, to our sponsor, uh, Trap Music Bar, and uh, to our partners, Red Bull, uh, Wishwap Consulting, Boho Chic, uh, Antena Tres Madara, Diário de Notícias, um, Barreirinha Bar Café, Tulipa, of course. And uh, always, always, always Studio 21, because without them, we couldn't do this. So, Studio 21, thank you very much. And we have Wino there doing some cocktails, non-alcoholic, <coughs> for our guests, because this guy over here is, is, uh, is drinking an alcoholic one, because uh, I need to loosen up. <laughs> I, mean, I need to loosen up, you know. Let's try, you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, uh, well, uh, I'll, um, I'll introduce my wonderful guests uh, today. Kevin Ebling Evans, art curator at Art Center Caraval and archivist for the Holy, Tri Holy Trinity Church. And the British Cemetery. <laughs> and the British, British Cemetery. You, Happy to be here. And Manuel Caldera, electronics engineer, businessman altogether, and YouTuber. <laughs> content creator. Yeah, yeah. You like to be called YouTuber or content creator? Just call me Manny or Manuel. <laughs> Manny, <laughs> Manny, Manny, enough. Manny, Manny. Thank you guys for being here with me and accepting okay. the, the invitation. Pleasure. My first question to kick off this conversation <laughs> is with all your knowledge and experience, you could be successful, successful anywhere in the world. Why Madeira? I was born here. I came back. I left many times and I always wanted to come back. That's how you know you're in the right place. It's a great place to live. It's just a great place to live. And with the, the opening up of the world via the internet, especially via the internet, there is no limitation here. Everything that was a limitation has been overcome, except mm -hmm. travel, but then look what happened recently. Nobody can travel. So That's true. very quickly I realized that um, this is a place I wanted to spend my life. And that's where I am. And why not uh, South Africa? Because you grew up in Harry Smith, is that correct? That was where I first went to, then mm -hmm. Peter Maritzburg, and then Durban University. And then when I finished that up, I made a decision that South Africa was not the place for me, for various reasons. And uh, that's when I decided to leave. And when I left, I was moving to the UK. Mm -hmm. And while I was waiting for all the paperwork, I came to Madeira. And I saw Madeira for the first time as an adult. And I thought, this is it. And that was what did you see city. differently? From being a kid to being an adult, what was okay. the difference? Uh, most of the people that are watching this on Madeira, uh, they'll know what I'm talking about. Mm. When we came over on visits from South Africa, from anywhere else where, we, where most Madeirans were immigrated, mm -hmm. you'd arrive here, you'd go to Granny's house. Uh, you'd drive yeah. to Granny's house and you'd spend a month in Kileta, in my case, and you'd come to Funchal once maybe, right? So, seeing Madeira from that perspective was certainly not a place that I would consider living in. When I came and moved here, I was actually able to experience from Charles and the whole of Madeira as an adult. I realized this is completely different to what I had uh, in my brain from, from, from a child when I left here. And this is why I decided to stay. Very nice. Kevin, why? Why Madeira? Because you, you, you came to Madeira... Um, to retire, oh. is this correct? Uh, um, that was oh, oh, oh. <coughs> invaded. <laughs> or invaded. So without alcohol. It, yeah, that's non-alcoholic. I love the so salad. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> the salad definitely yeah. makes it. Cheers. Chin -chin. Chin -chin. Cheers! Salad. Cheers! <laughs> mine is definitely <coughs> alcoholic. No. Very good. Thank obrigado, Wino. Obrigado. Thank you. Without Wino, we wouldn't uh, have a, co a proper conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was quite complex. Um, and I think the fact that it was a complex set of circumstances 
um, helped me make the instant decision I made, because when I made the decision, it was instant. But there were things like, <clears throat> I mean, I was in a particularly difficult job. I was working in a specialist residential school for uh, children that had behavioural problems. Many were um, sexual offence victims. And after about three years, I was burning myself out. And so my local GP just said, I think you need a break. Mm. So I'm going to write you, write you off for four weeks uh, off work. And he said, why, do, why don't you go on a walking holiday to Madeira? Okay. And I was slightly shocked. First of all, he didn't know that my partner was Portuguese at all and had spent a few years in Madeira. So there was a sort of clunk in my head. And, and secondly, it was the immediate rea gut reaction was, my God, am I that old? <laughs> because the British, and it's still true, if you look at the varying um, <clears throat> tourist guides, that the, you, you know, tourists come from Germany and all over the place, but the ones that come from Britain until recently have been the retired Brits who come here for a sort of winter holiday. And my image of Madeira... I mean, because <clears throat> I'd, I'd lived in several places on the south, south coast of England, uh, Torquay, Falmouth, Bournemouth, Brighton, all these places which mm -hmm. are traditional British uh, holiday uh, areas. And they've all got some aspect of Madeira, Madeira Avenue, Madeira Drive, Madeira Gardens. Okay. So that's in the back of your head. And I just imagined that Madeira was like full of elderly people sitting on park benches with vultures <laughs> circulating above, <laughs> waiting for them to drop off the end. So I think Madeira and then conversations at home. And I'm thinking, oh, OK, let's let's just go. So I came. Let's try it. Yeah, let's try it. So I came for basically what should have been two weeks holiday in November 2008. And I mean, I won't lie and say it happened when I got here. Because whenever I go to a place for the first time, I always tend to look at estate agents. I'm very interested in architecture and the sort of estate agents background I've worked in that mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at a few estate agents online and I saw a really intriguing little cottage in Encamiada. So I thought, well, while I'm there, because I don't want to sit on a beach, and, you know, I, I, I'll go for a walk and maybe we'll have a look at this place. And that's exactly what happened. On day two, I walked up and okay. saw this place and I literally bought it on the spot. But it looks like Wales. Yes. You chose, you chose mm -hmm. the place. Uh, part this of is, the this isn't part yeah, of the Garda. This is no, a different Kukunyada place. Looks oh, like Wales it as does, well. absolutely. Yeah, that, Except that no is CVs. Interesting. No CVs. No yeah. CVs. But <laughs> no, and, and it all went on from there, really. Um, and I never looked back. I mean, the, the idea of buying it was for a holiday, you know, place to come mm -hmm. two or three times a year. It fitted in with our schedule. But I went back to Britain and I couldn't get the place out of my mind. Mm. And I literally instantly made the decision then, sell up everything, give in my notice. And I moved here six months later. Wow. So you fell in love. It was instantaneous. Yes. Literally after the plane landed. And I remember the smells getting off oh, the really? Yeah, I remember the smell of the island. Um, I'm somebody that, that knows Greece very well, more so than even Britain. And I always imagined I would retire to Greece. So you can imagine this is quite a change of plan. <laughs> <laughs> it is quite a dramatic <laughs> reaction. Well, we're, we're, we're glad that you sh chose Madeira because we're very <clears throat> hospitable. So Definitely. hospitable, is it, is yeah, it hospitable? Right. So yeah, Definitely. so yeah, we like like to receive people from outside and everything. So that's yes, and, that and who would know it was Jurassic Park? <laughs> <laughs> no dinosaurs here, as far as we know. <laughs> I know a few politicians. Carry on. A few, po uh, uh, yeah. I mean those, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Manuel, uh, you always loved the world of electronics, or is this something that appeared when you were a teenager? How how everything how did everything started? It started when I was about twelve. Twelve, all right. And I took it up as a hobby, mm -hmm. and it continued as a hobby. And then, <coughs> when university time came along, there was no question as to what I was going to do. So I went to university. I did my electronics engineering degree, and then I went into the workplace at Siemens in South Africa and realized I didn't want to be an engineer. Okay. Fortunately, I discovered that after finishing the degree. <laughs> 
<laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have finished. <clears throat> I wanted to deal with people. I didn't want to work on work on the tech side. Just mm. work on the tech side is something I didn't want. And so I went into the, the commercial aspects of engineering, and then it went on to just commercial, and then I left South Africa. So it's a hobby. I studied it, made it my, my degree, and then left it dormant for many years and then took it up as a hobby again. So and uh, is that recent? Is that uh, <coughs> the revival? Why? The revival is about mm. well, since about eight, nine years ago. Okay, it was always there. I was always reading stuff that had to do with electronics and doing something off the side and not everything. Doing much. Not, I not didn't really have much. a workshop at mm. home or anything like that. And then um, at one point, uh, I decided to try an old radio that was sitting in my father's, my parents' attic, and um, this thing had belonged to my grandfather, and it had a lot of meaning. And my old man had died, so I decided ah. I want to restore this thing. And that was the bug. It bit me. Mm. <laughs> and since then, <clears throat> it's got to the point where it's kind of ridiculous because those things are big. Valve radios are big. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you start having 12, 15 at home, your wife looks at you sideways. So <laughs> <laughs> but, but the, in, the uh, initial the connection, kind of, you had an emotional imagine. sort of connection to it. D have you retained that sort of emotional always, reaction? Always. always. Yeah. That's always. the true collector. Um, but yeah. No, no, no. Hang on. The, the <coughs> connection, the feeling is not <coughs> from owning it, having no, it, it's, it's from doing it. Oh, okay. And that's where I'm oh. lucky because it means that I can actually do my hobby and give it back. Ah. Oh. You see, I don't need to keep this thing off. That's the human <laughs> aspect, no? That's the human aspect you <coughs> were seeking. Yeah, so I, I like dealing the with people. Yeah, but I like the set. No, this, this hobby is very, very, very uh, solitary. You know, when I get into a workshop and I spend three, four hours a day every second day or so, there's nobody else there. Mm. Mm. That's completely the opposite of what I needed in a profession. But as a hobby, I get there and what I enjoy is the process of restoring an old radio, an old amplifier, something that's older than me most of the time. Okay, mm. Most of the stuff is older than me. I was born in 63. So most of the stuff that I work on is older than me. Mm. And the fact that you can get this thing working like new like or better than new That's where I get my satisfaction. And once I'm finished with that, and I've got a new project going, then I prefer to actually give it back to the owner. Because most of the time, I used to buy a, them myself. And I, I had ah, them. So most of these that I do now aren't mine. I do the restoration. I create the video series. I publish the video series. And that's become a hobby in itself. The actual uh, YouTube channel has become a very important part of the hobby. I enjoy that aspect as well. And then I go into the next project. Marvelous, marvelous. What was it? What was it in, in in the company Siemens that made you realize that that wasn't for you? Siemens was, as is probably expected, they're German and they were very structured, so they had rules. When you started working with them as a new engineer, you had to do two years in a certain department, which was the purely technical department. And then after two years, you could then move on to a different department. And what I wanted was the uh, project engineering aspect. Mm. So in those first two years, you would be in a workshop with five or six people and you wouldn't see anybody else. So I said, no. Not for Manuel. Not for, Man no. for Manuel Caldera. <laughs> Kevin, um, so you, you, you're the art curator for Art Center Caraval. Sure. And it's uh, one of the, the your projects that that you, you put uh, time into it here in Madeira. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you have on your website that it's the biggest international art center, gallery and art shop based in Madeira. And you guys represent artists worldwide. Uh, you, you have art residencies as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have this sense of it's like a commercial gallery space yes. than rather than just uh, <clears throat> a, a normal gallery sure. where you you should just show the art sure. how did covid affected all of this we closed down it's so simple i mean can i just put this down a second of course the, <clears throat> i mean when we first um when it was first opened um it was aimed at just a sort of retail space and a temporary exhibition space but it was always aimed at both visitors to the island and locals. Wanted okay. be, it wanted to become part of the local culture. Um, but we soon realized that um, our main clients were going to be 90, 95% tourists. 
tourists. Of course, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then, I mean, I came in after it had opened. It had already been going for about a year, year and a half. Uh, and the gallery aspect, which is where I first went in, was just a temporary exhibition space. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the people that had opened it and were running it uh, are not Madeiran, they're not Portuguese, and they didn't really have any previous experience of such a thing, but huge uh, emotional attachment to the arts uh, from, a, from a peripheral area, mm -hmm. um, but no actual experience of, of retail selling um, or or exhibiting art in this sort of formal way. So that's why I offered myself, um, basically, because yes. I wanted something to do. Uh, because you have <clears> a background <throat> in fine art evaluation, correct? Yeah, sure. I started off as a, as a, as a, um, a collector. I mean, as, even as a student teaching history, learning to teach history, um, I would start collecting and spend... I'm a, a typical collector, this person that goes without food and heat <laughs> and gets obsessed <laughs> over things, OK? Um, and many, many years later, having built up this collection, um, I, I took my first um, retirement. I retired more times than Barbara Streisand. <laughs> <clears throat> so and I've changed, changed careers completely. So um, I literally... Uh, it was due to illness. <clears throat> I literally had nothing to do after being in a, in a profession for 17 years, except this collection of art. So I literally found um, uh, a gallery that was empty and bought it and put the contents of my house into the gallery. Is, is that uh, the gallery in <clears throat> Pet Petworth? Petworth, yes. In 1996, where you, yes. uh, you opened it for yes. the first time. Yes. So <clears throat> my, my experience was from a collecting point of view or from an academic art history angle. Mm. Um, and that was a steep learning curve. <laughs> and then I went back to university as a mature student to do a degree in then, as you say, fine art evaluation. Mm -hmm. And I'd worked in, I mean, the, the, one of the key components in my experience was this place called Pallant House. And right. Pallant House in Chichester in West Sussex was a sort of museum. Um, it's a sort of Queen Anne building. Uh, and into it, they placed the Hussey collection, who was to do with the cathedral. He was a churchman. And he built up this huge collection of his own private art and had helped um, Chichester the Cathedral um, <coughs> access contemporary art, which is still there, Chagall window and that sort of thing. Mm. So <clears throat> this was, I mean, we know Pallant House, but it is a traditional Queen Anne, early 18th century, beautiful house with this art on the walls and um, but it was a charity and they needed to make money. So they have a commercial wing. So I went in as the commercial manager and I would look after the shop, the tea rooms and the, all the selling exhibitions. So you have a, a normal museum, but within it you have a commercial aspect. Well, that's quite unique in Britain. It was wonderful to actually to be able to use the museum part of the buildings to display selling exhibitions of art. And that's a, a major difference. And if you, you, you've already mentioned this about it's not just a museum, you said. Yeah. I mean, with the museum, um, it, this is a fundamental difference. If you go to visit it, there is an invisible wall between you and the piece of art on the wall. You can't get near it. You can understand it. You can study it. But it will never be totally intimate because it's been placed there by a museum curator and it says to you this is art this is formal this association okay and you mm. can never own it you can never be part of it it's always going to be something different from you if you go into a commercial premises at any level <clears throat> i used to take my students into sotheby's and christie's and get them to ask the attendants to mm. take things off the wall so they can handle it okay. so that's the first thing is that you can handle the art because it's for sale, you can say, can I see the back? It could be yours. It could be yours. Can I see the back, please? You can't go into the Museum of, oh, of, of Sacred Art and say, excuse me, could you take that off the wall? I want to check the back. Yeah, let's check uh, Mona Lisa's back, yes, for example. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, you could. You could steal it. But, but it is interesting because the, the relationship between you and the piece of art changes. Even if you can't afford it, that doesn't make any difference. There is the ability to walk out of the building with that as uh, owning it, and by owning it, you become part of its history. Wow, that's amazing. 
that's a nice uh, way of viewing things. Yeah, so. unfortunately for Pallant House when I was there, they needed extra money, so they went into the lottery um, business, you know, um, the British lottery, and they got six million <laughs> awarded to create what is now the existing galleries, which is much extended. A modern architect came along and designed. It's like the, the Tate of the South Coast, we mm -hmm. call it. And um, in order to get the money, they had to stop the commercial aspects. So it's only a static museum. So for me, so, that yeah. was a really interesting experience. Um, the, the mix. I said, I used to call it oil and water. Oil and water. Yeah. The Very oil is the commercial. The mm -hmm. water is the museum. The traditional <laughs> museum. People will disagree with me. The oil always comes to the top, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, let's get personal. We have a little game that we do here in Relampada called Explica Misto. Andei a vasculhar as tuas redes sociais e vi este retrato. Explica Misto. Explica Misto translated it's uh, Explain Me This. Some, something like that. And uh, we, we go on social media, we look for photos, and we choose one of or, or two photos of you guys, and we want an explanation <laughs> be, <laughs> behind those photos. Shouldn't have taken those nudes. <laughs> oh, damn. Well, you, you, <laughs> you don't never have told any nudes this. that I know of, so <laughs> we'll start with Manuel. So, Manuel, we want an explanation on this. Just... Just a second. What the hell is coming here? <laughs> Went an explanation on this. So oh, what, what are you doing? Paintball. P paintball? Yeah. That All was right. uh, <laughs> my wife's company uh, software. And we had an annual paintball competition. I look ah. good in a black suit, don't I? <laughs> no, I don't. Yeah, I mean, you look like uh, yeah, an engineer. <laughs> you look like an engineer in the first two years at Siemens. <laughs> That's how they dressed. Oh, really? Yeah, I think probably the dress is a jumpsuit. Got me out of it. A jumpsuit. It's, it's, a jumpsuit. it's slightly fascist. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is Black slightly shirt. fascist. Like, exactly. <laughs> okay. Now that was at Kajeres. Uh, okay. With a guy that organized these paintball tournaments, and we went and shot things at each other. That's it. No, no difficult. So explanation. this is uh, before because you don't have any paint on you. So I can't remember. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. I this think we before. were a little bit different. They at couldn't the end. take a photograph afterwards. <laughs> bit different at the end, like what? Uh, very lots uh, of color. Lots of, <laughs> color. Lots of colorful. Yeah, very co colorful. Very colorful. <clears throat> and are you good at it, or are you the first one to get shot? <laughs> no, no, more or less medium. No, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. I was probably one of the older guys there. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> That's always a disadvantage, who isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> who would have thought that Manuel liked paintball? That's very cool. I, I played quite a few games and it was always fun. It was fun. Paintball, everything you can do. And, this is in Britain. Is fun. This no, is in Britain. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, because yeah. oh, okay. yeah, they use this sort of thing a lot in corporates for, for yeah, team this was building. Like a team building thing, yeah. 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 Is that the bug? That's a B. It's a B. Or it's a, a B. Oh yeah, man, it, that, this is the first time, you know. Oopinay. We have a visitor here in uh, Lampada. It was a fly. Yeah. It was a fly for Michael Pence, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Do you want to tell us your story? You're on. Uh, yeah. Uh, this want, is a wasp. Don't sting it's us, not a though. Bee, it's a wasp. Yeah, that's a wasp. Oh man. Okay, so this is. It a came first. for the salad. This yeah. is a first. <laughs> Give it a drink. What, what do you? Do? What do we do with uh, with it? Ignore it. Ignore it? Ignore it. Okay, let's They're ignore it. They're just foraging, it. really. Okay, okay. so let's... Uh, we, um, Kevin, we want an explanation <clears throat> on this. Oh, God. This was your <laughs> hippie phase, no? <laughs> hippie phase. It, um, not quite hippie, <laughs> but... <laughs> it, <laughs> um, yes. Um, <clears throat> that's you, a, had, uh, you had hair back then? So I did. So that's I, a good frighteningly sign. <laughs> so, yes. And it was hennaed and permed. Which was very fashionable in 1976, I think that was 75, 76. That's after my first, that after my first university. Um, um, so I'm um, working as a residential social worker. Looking suitably <coughs> serious there. Um, yes. <laughs> Definitely serious. Well, I mean. What were I, you I, listening I, back then? I don't know how if I'm going to say this or not. Uh, okay, so <laughs> after college, <clears throat> this is Cardiff, by the way. I got involved with a group of people that were investigating... How can I put this? They were investigating um, um, pre-Christian religions. Okay. Uh, I got very much involved in that area. Um, 
of sort of the new paganism that was very sort mm. of so you weren't too far out when you said hippies but the hippies are more 60s okay. <laughs> this is the serious thing that came afterwards this is from I see okay the new wave <laughs> the, the, the new, new wave, wave is, of yeah. hippies this is after Jesus Christ Superstar the musical ah uh, right? yes and, yes <clears throat> and, and I'd started going to Greece so the henned hair and the beard are, are, are remnants of my first treks around Greece Okay, very nice. What were you listening back then, music-wise? Um, what I've always listened to, I'm, I'm terrible. I only listen to classical music. Classical music. Yeah. I mean, okay, <laughs> you went to a nightclub. You couldn't actually ask them to put Mozart on at the nightclub. Yeah, club. put Mozart in. So it was Tamla Motown. That's a contrast, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Very Tamla Motown. <laughs> very interesting. I mean, this wasp is making a lot of noise. He's got to sleep. There we go. He's got to sleep. Now is it. Though. Now is it. Okay. <clears throat> Again, really? All right, Manuel. We want an explanation on That's this. Me. I'm worried. On <laughs> this, you look like a gentleman yeah, here. What the hell was that? Gentleman. What a gentleman. This is man. This is a wasp that's make me, making me nervous. It's ah. going for the man. heat of the light bulb. This Go away. Porto, I think. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure. Looking very no, no, young it's here. Not. It's not. That's Amsterdam. Hi. Sorry, guys, but this is making me nervous. <laughs> we need we need someone to to do something about this. Manuel, go away! Oh, oh, oh! What is it? I knocked it. Hit, it hit the the car. It's a wasp. Okay. So, Manuel, you're clearly not Buddhist, aren't you? <laughs> Yeah, no, Buddhists no, no, don't... No, I, uh, I'm joking. I actually am. I gave him a lot of chances to leave. You did. You did. Absolutely right. And then it gets to a point where, like a child, you have to show him that you meant it. Yes, you had to bring, ah, car yes. you had to bring the karma back that, to yes, it. Yes, that's <laughs> a good strategy. Yes. I'm so, not sure whether Manuel, that is, that's either... You're looking Porto very or academic here. Amsterdam. So. Very my wife got me by surprise. I don't know where it is. <laughs> no explanation. No explanation. You look like a professor here. <laughs> <laughs> Do many people call you a professor <clears throat> or a teacher of some sort because you teach a lot of people in, in your uh, YouTube channel? Uh, yeah, I guess they do, but it doesn't feel like teaching. It just feels like bullshitting. Sharing. <laughs> bullshitting? Not something. sharing? Just bullshitting? No. <laughs> uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't go in with the intention of teaching anything. Mm. I report what I've done, what I've found, what I think, and sometimes I ask for help. I've done quite a bit of teaching in, in the commercial sense, mm. communication, leadership, blah, blah, blah. That's teaching. But in the technical side, it's just mm. put it out there. Even when you don't know what the hell something is, you just say so. And you'll be surprised what you get back. Mm. You learn more than you teach. Mm. Oh, that's, that, yeah, that's very interesting. So, okay. Our last picture from you, Kevin, Goodness. is... So you had the hippie phase, pagan phase, we say, and then you had this. Whoa. What is this? Where the hell did you get that from? What is this? <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. Yeah, I went through my um, gym bunny stage. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So. It started... <laughs> I mean, like I was never some... Paintball I, as well. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, I actually owned a tank at that time. A, a military tank. You owned a tank? Yes. Oh, God. Do you want the story? <laughs> yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> Not just me. We, we need to know this. I've always been into this. motorbikes all my life, so I've always okay. had loads of motorbikes. So. Kevin, sorry. You owned a tank, you've always been into motorbikes. There's a long <laughs> way to go there. Carry I know, on. but it, there is a connection. <laughs> because I used to run um, a large motorbike run. I was I used to lead a, a large motorbike group. Yeah, based in the south of England. Mm. There's about 40, 50 members. Um, wow. It was, you know, but it's part of, of an organisation that covers the whole of Britain and, in fact, Europe. So each country used to take it in turns each year to set up the annual holiday and motorbikers would come from all over Europe to, to whichever country it was. So I had this, this group. I mean, and, um, and we, 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 we each do something different when we reach middle age. <laughs> and for me, on my 40th birthday, basically... You were 40 years old here? Just That's just a 41, I think. 41, 41 42. okay. I, I started I going... <laughs> no, no, I started going to the gym. 
okay. I mean, I've never been sporty in my life. I mean, apart from table tennis, which I was obsessed about. Oh, table tennis? I never, yeah, I never All played right. anything except <laughs> table tennis. Um, and um, my midlife crisis was was to, to uh, you know, a typical me, I never do anything in small things. I always do something big. So Grunch. I got a personal trainer and I went to um, him every day. The, the, the arrangement was I had to go there for two to three hours every morning at eight o'clock in the morning Sheesh. for seven days a week for wow. six months. That was the only Jesus, contract. all days. Yeah. All day. And it was across the worst part of West Sussex commuting at eight o'clock in the morning. That's what you need to think. No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sort of produced that sort of body image. And if you can, you know, when you go through that, when you're in that sort of environment, as I was, with the motorbikes and the leathers, um, you got interested in sort of peripheral things. <laughs> and in Britain, it is perfectly legal for you to own a military vehicle, as long as the gun or whatever it is is yeah. decommissioned. Decommissioned. So, and there are, um, you know, groups of people that go off every Sunday, leave their wives and have these military <laughs> events. Like the classic car stuff that you have here. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. the same yeah. sort of thing. But you have a military, it's a military <laughs> equipment. And they could be rocket launchers. They, most of them own, you know, Jeeps. And most of the people are of a certain age and they actually did have uh, experiences of the Second World War, I should mm. say. So yeah. there's a, you know, there's a link. Um, and I got in touch with this organization that was selling, that restored and then sold on military uh, vehicles that they had acquired from Her Majesty's Army, Navy and Air Force. Okay. And I bought a Daimler Ferret, which I call it a tank. It's a little tank. <laughs> um, it had a, a, a machine gun on the turret instead of a cannon. And it had um, six wheels rather than the tracks. Where did you keep this thing? In my garage. <laughs> and I have photographic uh, evidence. How big is your garage? <laughs> it only took the tank. <laughs> my cars had to stay outside. You know, I, I could keep one motorbike ne near it, but I had this. And I used to go you, shopping you... to Sainsbury's in it. <laughs> this thing had a, a, a license to, to, to drive yes. on the streets. It come, it's in, oh, wow. in, in Britain, it's called a classic. It's like a classic car. You don't pay road tax. Um, okay. I mean, it's a, it had a Rolls Royce engine. I suppose if you've got a gun in the front, nobody will <clears> ask you to play. Well, it's decommissioned. <laughs> I mean, it was great fun. And we used to go off uh, for charity, you know, charity events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Raise money for charity. Go off to the army base in Dorset and do their assault course, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the army always thought we were <laughs> army because we had all the uniforms and everything else. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I remember getting pants, I got these stopped. pants are very camo. I got stopped on the motorway outside Portsmouth one day, coming back from one of these events. Uh -huh. And um, I never drove it. Um, the ferret is, is for two to three people. So you've mm. got a driver downstairs with a visor and levers and things, and he's got a wheel that does this. You have to be quite strong. So How I had... I had thing um, you'd be surprised, actually. You could get it. I mean, because it hasn't got a track. So it's oh, got yeah, wheels. The wheels. Yeah, okay. They're solid wheels, but they're wheels. Like 40, 50 miles or more? You can certainly do 40 because it was on a motorway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I had my usual position sitting up, up, up on top <laughs> with, my, with my metal hat. <laughs> and oh, somebody man. sitting next to me without Amazing. a hat and the driver inside. And we got stopped by the police. And strangely enough, he was South African. Oh. <clears throat> he was a traffic cop. <laughs> Of some <laughs> some status. I mean, he wasn't just your average cop. Yeah. <clears throat> the flashing lights that we were pulled over. Just imagine stopping and going. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and, um, and he and he said he said um, okay. He said I know you're not really army. And I said, oh, how did you know that? You know, it has a number plate, <laughs> a traditional British number plate on the back in yellow. Um, and he said, because I used to, I used to write, drive one of these myself. He said, and he told me the story. He was in the army in South Africa, uh, so he knew he could date it. He said, and he said, nineteen sixty-four. I said, yeah, sixty-four. He said, where did you, you know? And I said, it did service in Cyprus. So its history, the vehicle mm. history, was mostly in Cyprus. Very and he said, I can't do anything about it. He said, I can't stop you. <laughs> but he said, I'm not happy. <laughs> <laughs> that was envy, no? <clears throat> envy. <laughs> uh, to be fair, a I had the metal envy. helmet on, but my, my mate had a f um, soft cap. And he said, ah. if he puts a helmet on, fine. And I said, I haven't got a second one. He said, well, he'll have to go inside. 
So he he then sat in the in the turret as the machine gunner, mm-hmm. <laughs> and off we went. And you have a tattoo here. What's this tattoo? It's it, like it's Pan. Mm. Pan. Yes, the god Greek god Pan. Okay, interesting. And why Pan? Um, God, <laughs> it was my first ex- when I was going back to the hippie days. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it was one of my first experiences of something that may be deemed to be um, spiritual or religious in a broad sense. Well, my first visit to Greece was a connection to Pan and Hermes. And again, I never had tattoos until I went to that crisis, <laughs> crisis. <laughs> with my motorbikes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but at least that original, not like this. The get today, this sort of nonsense uh, that you get today, yeah. which is fashion. I mean, mine are real tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> real tattoos. That's real it. Tank, not a <laughs> and a real tank. I had. Well, I brought a hammer with me here when I first yeah. arrived. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this was Shpuke Mish. Very cool. Right, we got away with it. We got away we with got it. Got away Thank with you. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So where did you get that photograph from? Facebook. <laughs> it's. It's there. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> it's there. I could check that. <laughs> I'm not a hacker on or anything, no, no, so don't worry about it. <clears throat> um, what's the moral of your wife's? Of my what? Life's. Ah. What's the moral? Your wife. Not that you guys are old or anything, but uh, Please. what until yes. now? What's the moral of your wife's? Change, but always for the better. I've made so many changes in my life. And ultimately, it gets down to... This is going to sound so corny. So corny. Let's hear it. It gets down to people and the people you have a relationship with. Friends, family, that's the important thing. Everything else... Everything else is just by by the way. That's the moral. If I change, I'll tell you. <laughs> Your turn. Kevin. For me, it's truth. Your own personal truth. No matter what. Um, and there have been episodes when, in order to express my own personal truth, um, there were disadvantages as a result of it. But that never stopped me from, uh, as we said before the interview started, I said, how candid was I allowed to be? Because that, to me, is really important. If if anybody asks me any type of question, I always say, I'll answer it truthfully as long as you are prepared for the answer. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, and that's even true of my work in the gallery, when young artists and even mature, <coughs> experienced artists come and ask if they can have an exhibition or be part of an exhibition. The first thing you do is say, <clears throat> can I see your work? And they show you the work, whether on a, on a camera or the actual, uh, actual work is brought in. And I say, now, if you want me to give my opinion, because it is just my opinion, mm-hmm. I will tell you this truth. And I've lost some <laughs> friends on the island who were rather amateur in their artistry. And I wasn't prepared to write a critique um, clapping on the back. I wanted to write my own critique and it wasn't accepted. <coughs> so I lost their friendship. So, but I think to me it's really, really important to be your own truth, no matter what. That must be tough. It's not easy, but but then again, but you, I say that it is actually. Especially when it involves <coughs> someone else's art. Oh, you mean with that particular? It's very personal yeah. it's and very, everything. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I always say there's no such thing as good or bad <laughs> art. There's unsuccessful mm. art and successful art. And if the artist has managed to convey what they set out to do, mm-hmm. then that is successful. Yeah, makes sense. Makes total sense. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good a good way of living. And most, the most truth. young young people actually but, are um, really quite open to this sort of thing. It's, I found here. I think they've become a lot more really? open than the other generation. Definitely, definitely. The only problems I've had here um, with <coughs> with local talent have been with established characters. Ah, okay. That don't seem to understand what criticism is. Hmm. I uh-huh. take it very personally because they yeah. because they are comfortable. You say here in Madeira, since it, there's not <coughs> uh, like a big, uh, <coughs> big, big publisher of uh, art critique or anything like that. So I, you I think th- it's you more fundamental. I think it's more fundamental than that. I think, and I lo- in, to some extent, it's hugely advantageous. The, the the teaching system here is wonderful. 
Uh, if you compare a young teenager here with one in Britain, mm. the British is going to be um, mostly more naive, maybe, certainly more gauche. Here they have much more social skills mm. and they are more confident and they have access to all sorts. I mean, the performing arts here are amazing. The music scene here for this tiny island population is extraordinary. Yes, but, and that's my only but, is I'm not sure they are brought up um, with a real understanding of the realities of it all because they've been complimented and encouraged. You get a lot of people... And it's too much of that that yes. makes people... There isn't the critique that goes with it. They've got a lot of aunties and cousins at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, Completely. I'm afraid. And on top of that, you've got this thing here, which is political patronage. Mm. Um, oh, yes. <clears throat> I mean, I've se I mean, I've been here now almost 12 years, so I've seen quite a bit of change. But you still have this patronage that comes from the sort of political elements. And usually in, it's, it's doled out, you know, um, or it's a competition. Mm. And um, there are, I have experiences of the competitions where it's just done so that the tourist industry can get free material. Don't you think the internet... Mm. I get back to the internet. <clears throat> Don't you think the internet has added a bit of democracy to some of the talents? Definitely. Because uh, now it doesn't matter who you are. Well, mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's no longer working. I mean, two and a half years ago, I think it was, I was speaking to the ex-minister of, of tourism. Um, she came to the gallery to an exhibition. I, wonderful, I, I, I thought she was wonderful. And she was saying that the political <coughs> entities had deliberately created an atmosphere for the music scene over a 30-year period in order to encourage and create this. And, of course, it ended up with the Conservatorio mm -hmm, and you have all mm -hmm. these wonderful musicians. Um, <coughs> but it's not worked with the art scene. And she said they thought about re re do going through the same process for the art scene here, but they found that the youngsters were no longer interested in this sort of political patronage. It wasn't working. Mm. Um, and that's why she came to us, because we were a commercial gallery. She wanted to know what's the resource we would be offering for younger artists here. And, you know, I showed her we deliberately encourage it because we don't have to make a huge profit or any profit at all. We, we can be much more loose with the selection of artists. And we've, we've, I mean, it's only been going, you know, four or five years. And we've, we've created quite a nice environment for, I mean, Portuguese youngsters to come through mm -hmm. that are going to be something someday. They are definitely. Um, Super interesting work, Kevin. And thank you for that. Uh, Manuel, um, so YouTube channel, more than 11,000 subscribers, Gosh, lots really? of people all around the world, lots of comments. What is the weirdest comment you ever received in a video? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the weirdest comment is just, I'll go back a little bit. Of course. Most of the stuff I restore <coughs> is vintage valve slash tube equipment mm -hmm. that works with 300 volts <coughs> and above. And the weirdest comment that I've received more than once is how do you take the back cover off a radio that... How do I take a back cover off the radio that I want to restore? This is a viewer who wants to restore a radio and, and he didn't know how me to, to help him take, take off the bloody back cover. Right? Okay. It's like a mechanic uh, saying, and how do you, oh, I want to restore yeah. the engine, how do I open yeah. the door? Yeah, that's pretty much it. And so, how do you do it? It's just unscrew the screws? Yeah, in but it? you shouldn't be asking if you're going to play with 300 volts. But is it, yeah, it's a bit is, basic. That a, is that, is that a, some sort of a meme? No, it's not a meme. No. This was serious. The guy, is it serious? The guys <clears throat> know they play with stuff that can So it's kill various them. people. Lots of people have asked me <laughs> really? questions that are very dangerous. Lots. I've got my videos all at the end have a warning saying, yeah, unplug it first. <laughs> yeah, high voltages can kill you. <laughs> and he asked me how to take off the bloody back cover. How do you respond to that? So I said, don't. Yeah, I, no, I, don't. I, I noticed yes. that. Walk uh, away. I, I noticed that you reply most of your comments or pretty much all of them. So I tried you, to. You, you just say, don't do it. To I those just comments? said, don't. Don't. Just don't. don't. And when it's, I've had a few nasty <coughs> ones. I've had a few nasty ones. I mean, ones. haters, of course. What uh, I do is I play with that. Mm. 
And then uh, I like I like I actually enjoy a challenge of a nasty bastard. Oh yes, absolutely, <laughs> I love it. But but isn't yeah. that a sign of success if you got trolls coming to yeah, you? I think you do. I think, I you think do. so. Yeah. yeah. You see, th this is the thing. You know, you, you were talking about the art <coughs> scene in Madeira and its limitations slash characteristics. This applies to this channel of mine. Yeah. I've got eleven thousand subscribers, mm. but. There are kids out there with three million subscribers. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. You know? Yes. There are guys who put Influers, up one video. Influences. They put up one video today, and by tomorrow they got more views yes, than sure. I've had in the last sure. two or three months. <coughs> sure. So I do know how small this is, but I do have fun with it. And because it's eleven thousand subscribers, it's not, you know, a million. I still can answer most of the. Of course. Because the the, the channel has become a bit of a hobby. Mm. And seeing what people say is part of the hobby. Sure. That's why I do it. Of course, and you have people from all over the world commenting and uh, interacting with you. Yeah. Um, how did this start, the YouTube channel? <laughs> and how is it going now? So, so you have a process uh, of it. You have like two, one, two, three hours in, in some days to no. work on this because this is like editing. This is yeah. making the descriptions, uh, making the titles. And doing all sorts of, of, of this work. Yeah, it, it started off with just, <coughs> I was doing a, a restoration. I did quite a few restorations that I didn't record, just mine. Mm -hmm. And then I decided, somebody convinced me that I should record it and log it. Not teach it, just record it. And so I'd finished done doing something and I said, let me, oh, no, I remember what it was. I got a radio that was completely filthy. The, the the inside was 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 you know that thick with dust and oh, really? and grime and you could any them. bugs any bugs inside lots no? of bugs lots of lots bugs, bugs. cockroaches and, and everything what, what would be cool is to have a before and after photograph sure. ah, absolutely yes and so I took off I had to go and look for a very good camera which was the iPhone that was it that's all I use <laughs> not one two three four no, not not the whole studio thing and I took a photograph and I felt like saying something and I thought. Okay, let me, let me put it on video. And I started recording what I was seeing. Mm. And that's how the first video developed. And it did become easier because um, you're talking about editing. The process of editing now, I do follow a, a routine. I don't, don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. But it takes, talking about takes, I do things in one take. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I do various shots, but it's one take. <coughs> and sometimes it's not on the same day. You know, I'm doing something and I, I'll go and report back. But then I take those, put it into the, mm -hmm. the, the computer and use iMovie and edit it. Um, and I've got a routine, so it's become a lot quicker, but it's still a hell of a lot of work. Uh, yeah, of course it um, is. Yeah. You know, you're doing a 30-minute, 30 35-minute video. It takes you three, four hours of editing. Not all editing because you've got to render it and then you've got to change the or get the audio sorted out and then upload and then... It's a lot of work. <clears> if you <throat> don't enjoy that, you won't do it. Mm. Of course, you have two, to enjoy the process. Yeah, true. Yeah. Completely. But uh, I don't remember the question. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the craziest I, thing. I, I mean, uh, you, um, you post a video a week, is that it? Sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes one every two weeks. It depends. It depends. I, so I've, you don't have a schedule? You no, don't I've have made sure those that, kinds of... I've made sure that it's not a schedule. I've made sure that uh, people understand that I don't take requests. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I've requested one. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I do, I do say that this is my hobby and I'm recording it and logging it for anybody who's but interested. Do you, do, you kind of do you have an OnlyFans page? <laughs> <laughs> OnlyFans? <laughs> well, uh, he, he does have a Patreon, though. <laughs> so oh, yeah, yeah. okay. But, um, <laughs> you know, only somebody only will say, I like <laughs> this video, but what I really want you to do is a video on that. Mm. Oh, yeah. Okay, you know, so I, yes. I won't do that. If, if yeah. I find it interesting, I'll do it. Sure. Mm -hmm. But I won't go do it because some guy wants sure. me to teach him something. Sure. Of course. Um, I will tell people, go look on the internet, search, search yourself, you know, because they, they, they're lazy. People are lazy. Mm. And, you know. Yes, we, we have, there's a, a Facebook page for Brits in Madeira or Brits in Portugal or wherever it was. Mm. And a large percentage of the members are still living in Britain and they're thinking yeah. of coming over to move or whatever. Yeah. And they ask, I mean, every, they ask all sorts of questions. And my usual reaction is, you lazy bugger, yeah. come and find for yourself. <laughs> I had course. to go through all this. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but and the process well, is <clears throat> simple. It's, it's, yeah. it's, I feel like <clears throat> doing it, I do it. If I don't feel like doing it, I don't. And it's sometimes once a week, sometimes twice. It's always... The, 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 the most difficult thing that I had to do was to start a restoration mm -hmm. and to actually publish that video 
before the end of the restoration. Mm. In the beginning, I was really chicken shit. I used to finish the series, know that it works. And, oh, and then, it, okay. Now I just do it. And, and if, post it. Yeah. And if it, I'm confident enough to know that I'll get it working. And if I can't, I'm confident enough to know that I can say so. Yeah, sure. And it's not, not happened much. It happened to one of your Bang & Olufsen's. <laughs> what a coincidence. coincidence. <laughs> really? No restoration is possible. What a coincidence. <laughs> Kevin, just to wrap <clears throat> everything up. Sure. Um, <clears throat> does it grind your gears when people go to Art Center Caravelle and take pictures of every single piece oh, of art? It, yeah, it's a huge soapbox, I mean. And the policy has changed. Mm. I am, I mean, I'm not the, I mean, Sveta is the art director. Mm -hmm. I am just um, the curator. So I, you know, but when I first went there, slightly differently because I was teaching other team members of how to do it or how I thought it should be done. And I had signs up saying no photography. And eventually it, and I still think that's what, how it should be. I mean, you, uh, uh, you tourists, they go to Cabo Girao or whatever it is, <laughs> and they take all the photographs. They don't actually see Cabo Girao yeah, at all. That's they the come problem. away with this recording, yeah. and it's the same with art. They go into galleries and they take a snapshot at it, and they don't stand there and understand the art. Yeah, they go to the next one and exactly. start taking pictures and again. And it yeah. was decided that um, in order for us to be a little bit more friendlier with what's going on in the modern mm -hmm. world... Um, we decided that we would allow photographs to be taken and videos to be taken. Um, and in fact, um, Sveta had a great idea of putting up um, notices saying this is a great selfie point. <laughs> so we were sort of directing them in some ways. But the one thing I still refuse to allow is people to come in and take a video and have an ongoing um, voiceover. Uh, That's not yep. what we're about. Of course. Um, but then, you know, even with tourists, they d tend to treat us as a museum anyway because they're so used to going to museums. Mm. They come in and it's a free museum. So you know immediately they walk in. It's body language, th these types. And they're just, they're just waiting for the bus around the corner. So they're going to do 10 minutes. Yeah. And they'll walk in as if it's another museum and walk around it as if it's in a museum. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with it. But I'm not going to waste my, my time going up to them and saying, would you like a personal tour? And then me spending, you know, all the time talking, explaining the art. Because that's not why they're there. They're, there. they're actually there. So it's fine. But I still would say, no, if it was me, no photography. No photography. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, so we're going, to, we're going to end this episode with another game. Not a, <laughs> not a, <laughs> another fast, fast, fast game. Okay, and this game is called Nepersound, Under Pressure. Oh God. Under Pressure. As long as I don't have to dance it. <laughs> so, Under Pressure, uh, I give you guys two options, and you have to answer it as quick as possible. So, very quick, without thinking much, choose one of these options. So, you answer at the same time and see if you guys <coughs> agree. Okay? Oh, okay. Let's go. So... First one, sea or mountains? Sea. Sea. Asia or Americas? Americas. Asia. Okay. 70s or 80s? 70s. 80s. Oh, okay. Vintage or contemporary? Vintage. Ooh. <laughs> Two more. Punch or slap? <laughs> slap. Slap. <laughs> <laughs> And the final one is art or artist? Art. Art. Under pressure. Yeah. <laughs> Woo That's it. We did quite well. We did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, thank you so much for being a here pleasure. with me. Pleasure. Uh, thank you. We're going to have uh, a mystery question only for our Patreon, Patreon patrons. So stick around. For more information, patreon.com slash Glampada. Thank you, guys, again. And, uh, thank you. Até a próxima relampada. If you guys changed places, so 
Kevin would be uh, an electronics guy and you would be an art curator. Would you guys be successful? Do you think you guys could be successful in each other's uh, <clears throat> profession? 